Hi, everybody. I'm John Allen with High Security. I'm the Senior Product Manager. And with me today is Daniel Butler, the guy who knows everything about everything in our product line and an excellent trainer. He's here to walk us through some specifics about high security products, our control panels, and some of the other solutions that we have available for working with high security's HVM products. So Daniel, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, John. Good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, the topic today is the Smart Touch Controller and the HiNet Gateway. And let's get started. On the screen in front of you, are, we're showing you all of our hydraulic gate operators. Uh, probably the most common to, to many of you are slide driver, but we have very arm, strong arm. In the previous session, we talked about the strong arm M30, M50, our HVM product, and, and a little bit about that Hydro Wedge SM50, both HVM products. Uh, the Hydro Supply XL is the one that, uh, that's the HPU for the Hydro Wedge there. And we have a couple of swing gates, the swing riser and the hydro swing. All these hydraulic gate operators use the same uh, main circuit board, which is part of what we, we call the smart touch controller system. All right, but it's all the same circuit board for all our hydraulic products. And I'm showing you this slide just to kind of give you uh, functional areas. And it's, it's in the dark letterings. And at the top is in the gray box, we call that the electrical enclosure. That's where this uh, smart touch controller system is stored in, in, in that box the main circuit board and keypad that we'll see. But this is the brains of the system. This is what makes our operators smarter intelligence, okay? And then over to the left, it says the pump pack with braking. The, the whole thing that we show on the left there is, is the pump pack sitting on top of that is a motor, an electrical motor that could be AC or DC, but we commonly refer to this whole thing as the pump pack. And, and that's more like the heart of the system, right? Because it's pumping this hydraulic fluid through the system. And that hydraulic fluid goes out those a uh, quick dis disconnects on the front of that pump pack there through those hydraulic lines over to a, the mechanical part of the system, uh, the hydraulic motors. And, and you can see those there, the black motors there on the front end of those motors, the wheels. And so that's what spins the rail through this gate operator. Okay, so we, we have, the, again, the electrical enclosure, the pump pack, and the mechanical system the hydraulic motor. Today, we're going to look at a closer dive into this electrical enclosure here. We call that electrical closure the smart touch controller, and that's comprised of three components. Uh, one is what we call the power supply board. The power supply board has the, as you can see, that it has the comm terminals. There's eight of them, and they're bussed together. It also has a 24 volt DC tap. There's three of them. If you look at this power supply board, if, if you cut it in half, so the left side is more the AC side. That's where the, the 24, 27 volts AC comes into this and it gets converted to DC. On that power supply board in the lower left corner, you see a couple spade connectors. Those are actually two 24 volt AC taps there. Uh, so if you need that, it's there, but primarily people are plugging into these 24 volt DC because we're putting on peripherals that require 24 volt DC. Another component of the smart touch controller system is the, the keypad display. A few years ago, we updated the display from a four character LCD to the two line 16 character OLED display. So it's very vibrant, bright, visible in all lighting conditions and temperatures. So. And then you can see the dual function keys on there. We call them dual function. Uh, if you look at those keys out, the half is white, half is black. It's still just one key. So if you're pressing the key, you press right in the middle. It's not two separate keys. But in run or command mode, if you press the top key, it's the black lettering, if you can see that. It says open, and then the key below it is close, and then stop and the key to the right is reset. So in command mode, that's the function of the keys. If I press that menu key in the lower right corner then, then it takes on the white function, or the, the white lettering, the previous, the next, and select. So that's how you navigate through the menu system and set your settings, all right? And there's a couple of LEDs too that, that indicate status. Green is everything is good. If you go into the menu mode, the blue light turns on and red indicates there's a fault. And the third component of the smart touch controller system is the main circuit board that we talk call the smart touch controller. Let's take a closer look at that smart touch controller. The board was developed back in uh, 2002. It was designed by the former owner of High Security, Brian Denault. And uh, four years later, after they got a lot of feedback, they upgraded the board. And that's the board that we currently are using in all our hydraulic products today. It's called the new gen smart touch controller board. So let's look at a couple of uh, uh, components on this board here. On the left side, where all the terminal screws are at, there's one to 24 of those. That's where we connect inputs, okay? So if you looked at that top one, most of these, by the way, are normally normally open interfaces. 
there, there's four of them that are key, uh, that are normally closed. The first one is that number one terminal. And when you get your gate operator, you'll see that there's a red wire connected to that number one terminal. And it's going from there over to the one of those COM ports on that power supply board because it's normally closed. If you were to remove that red wire, the operator would not operate. So there's stop button, uh, open button, close button uh, as you go down here. And, and then if you looked at uh, terminal screws 9 through 12, that's where you could put on your box vehicle detectors. And coming on down, we'll look at some other things coming up at their sensor 1, sensor 2, sensor 3. Uh, down at the bottom is your fire department open, 24 volt DC. And so, so if you have a fire department open device, you connect one wire to 24 volt DC and the other one to this, and then you'd enable it in the menu system. And on the right side, I mentioned box vehicle detectors. Uh, high security has what we call our HY5B vehicle detectors. Uh, that's the breed. They, these came out a couple of years ago. John will talk about those coming up, uh, but they plug into those sockets on the side. No crosstalk, uh, independent operation. We'll talk more about that coming up, okay? But there's the free exit inside and outside of the trucking loops and the shadow and the reset connector. So there's four. At the bottom of the board, we have uh, radio options and dual gate. Radio options is if you put on a remote control or radio, you can connect it there. You can also connect it up on terminal number four. But radio options is there. And uh, to the left of that, we have what's called dual gate. There's three spade connectors there, a COM, an A, and a B. And this is how we interconnect two uh, gate operators. We, we define uh, uh, dual gate systems as three different types. One is, let's say you have a, in this case, we'll talk about slide gate. Let's say you had two slide gates and you wanted them to operate together in a biparting fashion. That, that's one of our dual gate systems. So you'd have, you designate one as a primary and one as a secondary, and that would be a, a, a biparting dual gate. Also, the second type would be what we call a sally port or interlocked gates. That is where you, you, you would have two slide drivers and only one could be open at a time. We used to see this in secure inspection areas, border crossings, and typically you would have a slide gate that would open, a vehicle would pass through, the slide gate would close, it would get inspected, and then on the other end of that, there's another slide gate and that would open and now the vehicle passes through. Both of those gates can never be open at the same time. The third dual gate system is called sequence gates. And that's where we use what we call a security gate. So that could be a slide driver. And maybe we're using a barrier arm, a strong arm, or even a crunch uh, strong arm. We would tie those two together. And the way that would work is the security gate is usually the slower of those devices in opening versus a barrier arm. So if someone gave it an open command, the security gate would start opening. And then uh, once it approaches its open limit, it was almost on its open limit, it would send a signal over to the barrier arm to open and, and then the barrier arm would open and they'd probably hit their open limits about the same time. The vehicle would pass through, the barrier arm would close and then the security gate would close. That's called sequence gates. So all three of those dual gate systems are, are easily, uh, installed by, by running a, a, a three wire uh, shield cable between the two uh, smart touch controller boards on each of those gate operators. And once you do that, then you go into the menu settings and set the settings and you're good to go. Pretty easy. And we have a couple onboard user relays. Uh, here we're showing two of those electromechanical relays or user relay one and two. There's, a, there's another one right above it, as you can see in, the, in this uh, photo here, of the smart touch controller board. We, we use that one. Usually there's going to be a sticker on there that's motor relay. So that's not available to you, but user relay one and two. And then below that, you'll see user relay three. User relay three is a solid state. That's a single pull, single throw. Those other two relays are single pull, double throw because they, they have three connectors on there. They have a comm and normally open and normally close. And for that uh, solid state, it just has a normally open and a comm. And up at the top of the board there, we have two RS-45 ports. That's an industrial communication standard. And later on, we're going to talk about a device called a high net. And that's actually where we connect the high net. At the bottom of the board there, you see two other connectors. One is called the RS-232. That's for serial communications. But the only thing we use that for is to connect a, a cable that we would then connect. The other end of that cable would connect to a laptop. And we have some software that allows you to interact with this smart touch controller. The Wigan connector in the lower right, we hardly ever use. That's only for updating software on our um, first gen smart touch controller board and, and we don't see many of those out there so you probably won't use that Wigan connector you know Wigan's used to control lighting and different things like that but we primarily use that when we're updating a software on what's called the smart touch controller classic board 
And we have a coin battery. That's a, your, your standard uh, three volt CR2032. The whole uh, purpose of that coin battery is to keep the date and time accurate. We onboard that smart touch controller here in what we call a non-volatile RAM, which means that when we turn off the machine and no power's on it, it's, uh, the contents of non-volatile RAM will still be there. Uh, and what we do is we, we create 320 entries in that. And this is what we call the event or history log. And it's really handy when you're troubleshooting something to be able to access and view that history log. And you can do that with some of our software or right there on the display. I'll talk about that coming up. By the way, if that, uh, that coin battery, it, it lasts three to five years, depending on you know, the environment and all. But uh, if it was to go out, you'd get alert 17 on the display that said bad coin battery, and you just replace it. If you didn't, you, know, you see that annoying message and maybe you're, date and time stamp on your, that event history log that I mentioned might be off, but it, all other functions of the operator would, would function normally. So that's really there just to support that uh, date and calendar function. And then the, the, you see that status LED. Uh, if, if this was live here, you'd see that pulsing. Uh, it's a green status LED and what we call the heartbeat of the system. There's a regular pulsing to that. And if it was erratic in some way, maybe fast pulsing or slower or a different pattern of that instead of just a steady heartbeat, it could indicate that there's a problem with that smart touch controller board. And I know here in the US, though, we have safety standards for our gates for uh, identifying entrapment risk uh, that, that could hurt someone as they traverse or, or uh, uh, work with our gates. And so we have safety uh, sensors that we put on our gate systems. Primarily those are photo eyes or gate edges and those connect get connected to sensor one, sensor two, and sensor three. Uh, notice on, on sensor one, two, there, there's two places for that sensor one. There's one on the side of the board next to sensor two and sensor three. There's also one at the bottom, but it's either or. You can't use them both. So the maximum amount of sensors we could put on this with using sensor one, two, and three would be three, right? But if you needed to put more than that, uh, there's a device that Miller Edge makes called MIM62, which stands for the multi-input module and it gives us six inputs and two outputs. And here in the US, UL325, when you're connecting it to those sensor one, sensor two, sensor three, we're saying those photo lines or edges are what we call monitored. Monitored means that before we open or close the gate, move the gate, we're gonna check that the, the proper amount of sensors are installed. Here in the US for a slide driver, uh, the, the minimum amount would be two sensors, one to cover the open direction, one to cover the closed direction. And if they are not installed or they're malfunctioning in some ways, we won't move that gate panel. It's, it's a safety feature. And we implemented this back in the US back in 2016. So we're monitoring those sensors that we put on. As long as we're talking about their sensors in our slide gates now, we bundle sensors with that. We bundle a through beam photo eye and also a gate edge. And this is a, a graphic that shows you those entrapment zones and where we might put the sensors. So again, on, on a slide driver, we require that a minimum of, of two external sensors be put on for the gate to operate for what we call both directions of travel. For the closed direction, that is when the gate is closing across the roadway, typically what we might put there would be a photo eye to protect the closed direction of travel. When the gate is opening, there's also an entrapment risk there. And what we tend to do is we, we think the good place to put in what's called a wired edge is where it says number one there, that drawing zone, because as the gate is opening, and if someone reaches through or gets trapped in there, it'll pull them into that area and, and cause some uh, serious damage or serious injury to the person. So that's what we recommend these days on putting those, the sensors that we bundle with our uh, slide driver, uh, one across the road, one on the trailing. And I'm not gonna go over this in detail, but, but as you can see, as we're connecting, here I'm showing a wired edge and for us, those sensor one, two, and three, I mentioned it earlier, but those are normally closed interfaces. A wired edge is, is a normally open device. And so to connect that to, directly to that, our sensor one, two, or three, it won't work because that's a normally open talking to a normally closed. We use what's called a gate edge module. And, and that's why it says up at the top, it says connecting a wire edge with the HY2 and C. The gate edge module is that little device that I'm showing here in the lower left. Okay, that's called the HY2 and C. It stands for high security, two normally closed interfaces. So it's got two channels. I can have, hook up two edges to this device. 
and it allows the a normally open device to be connected to our sensor one, sensor two, three, which again is a normally closed interface. Right? Also note that as we're connecting this, we don't put the COM wires on the COM terminals on the power supply bus. We connect those to the, what's called sensor COM, which is terminals 14 and 15 on the smart touch controller board. And once you connect something, now you've got the physical hardware connection, then you would go into, and that's what these, this, this little installer menu displays are they're showing you here. Now we're going into the installer menu, and because we've got this connected to sensor one and sensor two, we'd go into sensor one and define what is hooked up to that. So in this case, it's gonna be an eye, and you could have the eye set up to cover the open direction or the closed direction, and there's even one, if you have the right photo eye, that you can cover both directions, okay? And in this case, excuse me, I was talking about eye, in this case, it's an edge. So we'd be covering the edge in the open direction and the edge in the closed direction, sorry. And now here's the eye. So we, we have been shipping the EMX IRB MON, which is a through beam photo eye. And the top part of it there is the transmitter, right? That, that's out on the, uh, the gate edge itself. And then we have the receiver. And as you can see here, we're, we're connecting things uh, to sensor one and sensor two and also to the 24 volt DC spade connectors. We're not connecting anything to the comm terminals on that power supply board, because any comm terminal connection on a sensor is connected to the sensor comm terminals on the smart touch controller board, which is terminals 14 and 15. Also keep in mind on, on some of your devices, such as that CMX and IRB MON, there's some dip switch settings, so make sure you set those correctly. And, all right, so, so we've talked a bit about the hardware, Behind all of those interfaces, though, the, whether it's the fire department open, or as I mentioned, the sensor one, sensor two, there's the software that can, corresponds to that hardware interface. And, and that software is, again, I, I showed you the keypad display. And with that, we can, there, there's a two-level two, two menu system that we call the user menu and the installer menu. And once you hook up a hardware device or a hardware connection, You'll then go into the to the either the user or, or installer menu, and most of those settings will be in the installer menu, and then you'll you'll define what that interface is set up for. The the smart touch controller board is is, is not PLC based or anything. It, it's a it's a microprocessor based controller board, and as a result, the 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 real thing that makes all the settings and makes everything works it, is firmware in the board. For the hydraulic operators I, on this screen, you can see that that, that we have different versions of that. And for what's called the new gen SDC, the current version of version 461, uh, that's software that's available on our uh, website, www.isecurity.com. It's gratis. All you need to do is go there to the tech support and download it. And then there's a second piece of software, and that's the application software. It's a Microsoft Windows application. We call it START. That stands for the Smart Touch Analyze and Retrieve Tool. START allows you to update the software on that gate operator. So if you download that operator software firmware to put that into the gate operator or onto the Smart Touch controller board, you would use the START software to do that. The other thing that the START software allows you to do is to look at the, that 320 event history log that I mentioned earlier. And you can see on that blue screen here on that START software, uh, it's the third item down on the left says view operator history log. The other thing you can do too is most of uh, the settings, I'd mentioned this on the keypad display, there's a menu, a user menu, and an installer menu. All those settings can be done here with the software if you go into the interoperator menu setting. Another thing with, with that, when you do go into the interoperator menu settings, you can save those settings to your PC and then restore them later. So let's say you were setting up multiple gate operators and they were set up the same, you could configure them in your office and, and save that file. And then when you go, go on site and you're, you're setting these things up, you could just load that into your gate operator. And so it would be quicker. And also you would know that it's, it would be consistent, that you wouldn't be missing an, an entry or, or putting something in wrong because you're just loading a file. So that's the start software, uh, a Windows-based, uh, whether it's Windows XP, Vista 7, 8, 8, 1, 10. Our next gen, we, we, we do things on smartphones, not so much on uh, Windows-based laptops. Hey, that, Daniel. Uh, yes, sorry, John, go um, ahead. There's two cables shown here. Yep. Which one do you use with the hydraulic machines? Yeah, right. Uh, I showed two cables, and because I, we have used this slide for both this, these hydraulic machines and our electromechanical line of operators that we call the Smart DC or the Smart Connects operators, they're out today, even though they don't require this cable because they use the smartphone. 
So, so we use the cable on the left, the one that says STC or SDC. SDC stands for a smart DC controller. I showed you on the board earlier that RS-232 port, John, and that's where you would connect this cable. So one end goes, it has two little white connectors. Uh, one end goes to that RS-232. If you're loading software on an old, on the classic board, there might be a time where you connect that second white cable over there to the Wigan connector. The other end of this cable gets plugged into your USB port on your laptop. It's basically an RS-232 serial cable, but uh, we don't have those serial ports on. We have USB ports, so, so that's, that's the way it works. It gets plugged into your USB. Uh, the, the cable on the right, John, that USB Type-A, that's only for the Smart DC cable, and so just ignore that one for hydraulic. All right, so let's take a closer look at some of the features that, that are possible on this it's intelligent Smart Touch controller system. There's a lot of power in this, in this uh, Smart Touch controller board. And we put a lot of feature function on there. Even things like uh, I showed you those user relays, we have about 37 canned options. So if something is on, let's say an open limit or a closed limit, you could have it do something by wiring a relay to that and saying, okay, when it's on this limit, maybe turn on this light or, or sound this alarm. And that's what we're looking at here. We're, we're looking at some security monitoring and breach reporting. And one of the features on ours is called gate forced open. So we have something called the FA, which is a force open alert, which means that if the gate is closed and it's something is forcing it off its closed limits, then the operator is going to sound the, the three, three second warning, that beep, 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 and then it's going to fire up its motor and try and reclose that gate. And it'll also show an alert one that a uh, gate was forced open. And if the gate is, isn't fully closed in about four seconds, then that motor is going to turn off and the buzzer is going to sound for three seconds. You can also have it, uh, you know, uh, connected to a relay and to turn on a light, like I said, a beacon of some sort, or notify someone. We also have one that's called the gate is open too long, and you can see that uh, we can set it by different time delays here. We had one of our customers that uh, one of the gates was, uh, they went to it and it was it was forced open. It, it, I mean, excuse me, it was open too long. They they just weren't notified about it and. I'll talk about a way of notifying you later, which is at the end, the second half of this presentation was the high net. That'll allow you to communicate that information to someone. Vehicle loitering alert. So what if someone's outside your gate and we've got some loops out there and they're just sitting on that loop and just hanging out there. And let's say it's two in the morning. We kind of look at that as maybe some suspicious activity or they're, they're casing the joint. So we, that will also generate alert. And, and you can see we can do it by different time values here. So the same thing some suspicious activity, we're, we're going to let you know. So this is one that's, that's tied in with, uh, to help with uh, tailgating or mitigating tailgating. Uh, we have on board our, our operator, usually there's always a way of opening the gate, right? Someone badges in or a guard is there, presses the open button. And then a lot of times you, you also want a way of closing the gate. And, and in our user menu, we have a one of the parameters there or variables is called the close timer. By default, the close timer is disabled. But if you enable the close timer, how that works is when a vehicle is passing through, once the gate is open and it's on its open limit and the vehicle passes through, once it clears all the, those loops, then the close timer counts down. The close timer is from zero to 99 seconds. So let's say I set it at five seconds. And so the, the car is passing through, the gate is open on its open limit, vehicle passes through, clears the loops, and then the close timer starts counting down. If you want it to close faster, and that's in the standard mode, and so that's called what we call DL equals one, the close timer's counting down. But if you want it to count down a little bit quicker to help with mitigating tailgating, uh, then we could have it to where the close timer is gonna start counting down as soon as it's on its open limit. It, it's not gonna close it until the vehicle clears the gate, but you can see that that's gonna shave off some seconds, right? It's counting down quicker. Before the close timer on DL one was starting to count down, that it had to be on its open limit and the car clears. On this one, it starts counting down with the close timer setting. Once it's on the open, limit, it still doesn't close it until the vehicle clears the gate. So and if you want it to close even faster, we, we have it, you, it as long as you had two loops, an inside and outside loop, and it's bridging those, then that'll trigger that when it's bridging those to whether to start closing it immediately or in DL4, it'll stop the gate. So this goes from DL1, 2, 3, 4, it closes the, the gate quicker and trying to stop from someone tailgating you in. But if someone does tailgate you in, we can also send an unauthorized vehicle entry alert. And so again, 
or you can turn on the light or let someone know or turn on a, an audible alarm or send something to someone to let them know that tailgating is happening. And now, and what works in conjunction with all this, and speaking of loops and everything, is our HY5B vehicle detector. I mentioned that earlier. John, can you talk a little bit about this guy? Sure. This is a proprietary design vehicle detector. Um, it only works with high security, smart touch, smart DC, and smart connects controllers. And it has a uh, sophisticated machine to machine interface with it that allows us to do a lot of things that nobody else can do with their vehicle detector. And Daniel talked about some of those things already, like the, the tailgating detection. This vehicle detector is sensitive enough that it can detect two cars going over a loop, even if they're so close to each other that the call status of the loop detector never changes. And identify that and flag that as a tailgating event and set an alarm or alert or some other response from the gate operator for that. But it has a bunch of other features that enable it to work very well with a gate. It has this feature called automatic gate compensation. I think there's another slide about that. It's got terrific immunity to lightning. So if lightning strikes one of the loops, great protection in there, a spark gap and dedicated grounding for that. We have three different metrics of loop diagnostics that we look at. And it even has the ability to uh, do vehicle counts. So we can monitor the number of vehicles in and out of an entry access point. The interesting thing about the vehicle detectors, if you see this car versus truck versus motorcycle, um, you can see that a car being lowered to the ground is the machine that provides the highest signal on a loop detector. And a truck with its high clearance provides a much weaker signal. Of course, the weakest signal of all is the motorcycle signal which can be down near the noise floor. I'd mentioned on that uh, of our download history log, those 320 entries. Every night, if you're looking at that log, you'll see that uh, every night, every midnight, every <laughs> midnight, we reset that. And so you'll see that in the log and it'll start at uh, where we show on this, the improved loop dynamics that 777. So it starts at 777. And as it goes through the day, as things change, you'll see those numbers change. And, and, and that could help you really determine if there's some noise issues or a bad loop going on, things like that. It really is apropos in helping you troubleshoot any loop issues you're having. Right, and that comes through in the um, event log and um, even show on the display of the Smart Touch controller. And I just wanna say a little bit more about how automatic gate compensation works. When you have a loop in the vicinity of, of a gate, you know, in this case, a slide gate, as that gate moves back and forth, it can induce a signal into the vehicle detector. And so what we do is we actually map that signal and memorize it and then null it out of the um, signal produced by the, the vehicle detector so that it takes that noise source out and allows us to have a lower noise floor, which gives us a better ability to detect motorcycles. Thank you, John. I'm gonna move on here, John, to some usage tips for the Smart Touch controller. The menu key at the bottom, if you press that menu key one time and you're watching the display, it will scroll different settings for the gate operator. You'll talk about something called build gear, or I'd mentioned dual gate. Remember we talked about those dual gate systems? You'll see that in the display if it's set up in dual gate mode. It'll talk about the operator type. Again, this one smart touch controller board is used in all those hydraulic operators. So the way we identify which one it's in is we have a field called operator type. So you would see an operator type of one is a slide driver, for example, or an operator type of eight would be the strong arm crash M30. And that's how we distinguish the different uh, characteristics of that board for that specific operator. We have handing, set handing. Handing is uh, when we make a machine, we don't know which side of the road you're putting it on. Yeah, for high security, it, when you're on the inside of the perimeter, not on the public side, but on the secure side, and you're standing at the operator, if the operator gate opens to the left, that's called a left-handed operator. If it opens to the right, it's called a right-handed operator. Usage class is part of the, the US, US UL325 safety standard. Uh, we, we classify different sites or, or installations according to whether they're more residential or industrial. 
or more hardened security. So that's what usage classes are. Uh, then we get input voltage and cycle count. This is like the odometer on your car, right? One cycle equals uh, uh, an open and close. So it'll tell you how many cycles. Maybe you could use that to base your maintenance on. And there's the close timer setting too, okay? So, so if you press that menu key on that key, display keypad, it'll scroll those settings and, and then it'll stop and at the bottom it'll say close timer. When it says that, I, I mentioned earlier that we have a two mode memory system. One is called the user mode and one is called installer mode. When you press that menu key two times and watch the scroll and stops the close timer, that tells you you're in the user menu, okay? If I did not want to see the, the, the scroll because I really just wanted to go to the user menu and change it, I press the menu key two times. By pressing it two times, it skips the scroll and in the display it says close timer. So now you're ready to just uh, do what you need to do in the user menu. And uh, the way you would, uh, let me see, it says press select key to stop the scroll. When it's scrolling, it, when, you, when you hit that menu key and you're watching the scroll, if you press the select key, it's also the stop button, so it'll stop it just in case you, you, you know, it's going too fast for you, basically, right? And let's go on to the next one to check the software version on your, on your gate operator. If you press that reset key once, the display will say high security, H461. H is for high security, 461 is the version number of the software on there. Cold reset. We capture a lot of what we call adaptive data. When John was talking about the HY5B, uh, we tune it to the environment and we store that data. But sometimes we, we want to clear out that data. Maybe we're having a, an issue and, and, we, and we're not sure, so we want to reset things. If you press that reset key, it does a, a reset. It's similar to turning on and off your operator, right? So, so you can do that. But, but what it doesn't do, because it doesn't remove all that adaptive data, because we store that in non-volatile RAM as well. So if you're really having an issue, and, and, and maybe one of the things was when we were working with HY5Bs initially, we were capturing a lot of data, and, and sometimes we wanted to clear that out and because we wanted to, it to reprofile itself, if you will. So to do that, you press and hold that reset key for about five seconds. In, in the world of like, uh, if you had a PC, if you did a warm boot, you, you press three keys and then reboot it. But if you did a cold boot, which would remove everything, you turn it on and off. This is like turning it on and off. It's a better way of clearing all that adaptive data off. So that's a good trick. Press that reset key about five seconds for a cold reset, okay? Check the date and time, press and hold the stop key, and that'll display the date and time for you. Uh, and, and on the LCD displays, this is not really apropos anymore, but, but for those four character LCD displays, different temperatures, they get a little bit washed out and you can change the contrast on those uh, by pressing the menu key. We talked about that 320 entries for that event history log. And for the longest time, the only way you could view that was with that start software and being able to view it in the start application itself. Uh, a couple of years ago, we thought eh, it's handy to be able to do that, to be able to view the log without having a laptop hooked up to it. Uh, so, so we built that feature in. The thing is we're limited by the display. So in the close, in the user menu, and we get there by pressing the menu key two times, I could press it once and watch the scroll and then I'd be there as well. But in the, in the use, user menu, there's a setting called LG and the LG stands for log, and the default is LG is zero. Zero in digital means it's off, right? And one is on. So we would select that, turn it on, and then you'd see the first line of the log, the first of those 320 entries displayed in the display. And to see the next one, you'd hit the next key. And if you wanted to see the next one, you'd hit the next key again, or go previous, use those keys. If you wanted to scroll down a bit, You'd hit press and hold that next key, and it'd be and it'd go multiple times. So you can see the the, the log now one lo one line at a time in the display. Pretty handy, helps you uh, troubleshoot again. And we've been talking about this, uh, and and there's a whole bunch of settings, and we, we we don't have enough time to talk about all those, but they're all in the reference material that we ship with the operator. And on the screen, I'm showing you two things. One is our tech support website, uh, tech support. To, to, to be able to get into, to get manuals and everything, we don't require that you uh, register, but for some other things, we do require that you register, but they've redesigned the website. It's really easy to navigate. And with every one of our operators, we have, they basically have two, two manuals. One is an installation manual. It's a smaller, and in, in this one, you can see on the upper right here, that's the installation instructions from the slide driver. That's maybe 10 pages. It's a bigger format, maybe 11 by 17. And then, so that's your installation manual, but the reference material for all the settings is in what we call the program and operations manual. 
That's an eight by 11, and that gets shipped with the operator too. But you can also find all these manuals in PDF form on that uh, NICE High Security Support Center uh, website here. And we've been talking about the, these things that, that, that we can, that we generate alerts for. And not only do we generate alerts, we have things on our operator called faults and errors. And we're, we have all that being stored there on our, on our gate operator in that smart touch controller board. But a way to, that we can communicate that out to security personnel or security manager, or even uh, uh, maybe the installer who, who's uh, taking care of your gate system. Uh, we can send them maybe a, an email and, or, or a text message to let them know what's going on in your gate operator. And the way we would do that would be if we connected this device called the HiNet Gateway SFP4 slash one. Really, we, this is the HiNet Gateway. The SFP stands for small form factor pluggable. That's that little thing on the right here. And the four slash mean, one means it's four 10, 100, 1000 gigabit ports and one SFP uplink. Okay, so let's take a closer look at this. Here's the overall view. Uh, the, so, so the high net is used for remote access, remote monitoring, uh, being able to view what's on your operator uh, remotely, right? It can control up to one gate operator and monitor up to four per each high net. You can see it's a four port switch. For security personnel, if it's faults, errors, or alerts, those can get forwarded to you. So even though they're on the operator, if you don't know about them, they're not as much value as being able to communicate that to someone else. Maintenance contractors, let's say you're an installer and you have a, let's say you had a residential customer a few hour drive from you and you had a high net installed on their gate operator. If something was happening on that high net, it would send you a, an email or a text and say, oh, this, this is happening, this alert, this fault and error. And then you could remotely access that gate operator and take a look at it. And so before you rolled your truck out to go service that operator, you could have a pretty good idea of what's going on with that gate operator, what the problem is, take the right parts for, and, and maybe even call uh, the, the end user. Maybe it could be something that was reset over the phone. The third thing on here, uh, we talked about parking lot managers. And, and initially when we came out with the high net, we were supporting more of the parking uh, arena, but we've kind of moved away from that, but we still capture a lot of counts on this. So uh, the high net in conjunction with the HY5B is really adept in doing a lot of counts. And in, in the world of parking, uh, knowing how many spaces are, whether their lot is full or if they've got empty spaces is, is, is a good thing for them to know, right? So they don't have to put sensors in each one of those stalls. But we don't do as much with parking today with the high net. Here's the integrated components uh, that are part of this high net. It has an embedded web server. It's much like uh, a router. If any of you have configured a router at home, they have embedded web servers and that, and which is a graphical user interface that allows you to easily configure it. It has an RS-45 interface. Uh, that's how we connect it to our smart touch controller board. So there's a translator in there that translates from RS-45 to ethernet or TCP IP. It is also a managed gigabit ethernet switch, which means that uh, you can get in there and configure it, okay? It's not one that you just set up and plug plug your cables in. You, you, you can set up, plug your cables in, and then you can configure it. Why would you configure it? Well, if, if you're a network person, you want to be able to control your bandwidth. And maybe if there's applications such as video and stuff, you want to make sure that those uh, get a certain quality of service so, so that the video isn't jittery or drops out, right? So, so you can do those things. You can prioritize and manage your bandwidth through a gigabit ethernet switch. You can also lock it down security wise. You can block uh, ports, you can allow certain things. And, and, and so for security, it's, it's uh, an improvement to have a managed ethernet switch versus a non-managed switch. As I'm working around there, that SFP port, the small form factor pluggable module, that that's allows you to put either fiber optic or copper into the high net. We do not support copper today because we've got those copper ports and we didn't think we'd need that. So, but we do support fiber optic. So that's a two and a half gigahertz link uh, and fiber optic in places like uh, Florida, even Colorado, there's places that have a lot of lightning going on. Uh, fiber optic is a little bit more immune to that than copper, right? On the front, we also have a couple of USB ports. I mentioned the embedded web server. That's one way of configuring this, but you could also, if you're a network engineer, Instead of using uh, a graphical user interface, a lot of time the network engineers, because it's faster and they do it all the time so that they know it pretty well, they use what's called CLI or command line interface. So that's commands that they type in, right? So to do that, that's why we put those USB ports on the front. 
you connect a USB uh, a cable to your laptop and using some terminal emulation software, you can configure this high net just like it was a Cisco switch or Cisco router. And then the other part we have on there, we have a micro SD card reader. Uh, we can store software out there to update the, the high net or a gate operator. And, and we can also write uh, download logs. So I'd mentioned on our smart touch controller, we have a limit of 320 uh, download entries, and that's just uh, restricted to the size of how much memory you have to store it in. I know we support up to at least 16 gigabyte uh, micro SD cards here. So you can quite write quite a log out there. You can get uh, more than 320 entries. I've covered most of this. The one part that I haven't covered on this is the fourth item down that says REST and RESTful Web Services, and, and actually the last item too. So we're gonna uh, talk about that right now. Uh, REST and RESTful Web Services. We ship with it that embedded web server that allows you to control one operator and, and monitor up to four. But what if you wanted to control all four? You could write some custom code to do that. So to customize the gate operator, excuse me, the HiNet software, you could use our, our API or application programming interface is REST or REST Web Services. Uh, REST is a pretty well-known thing out there. I think it was created by Cisco, as a matter of fact. And it, was a, it allows people to quickly uh, create uh, little applications and it's like uh, working with a high level scripting language. So it's not as difficult to work with as if you're working with C, C programming or assembler or something like that. So that's the REST and REST web services. That's the API to allow you to customize the high net software. The, the bottom entry, Active Directory and Radius Server for network uh, administrators in an office uh, you have, when you, when you log into your network, that's a function that we call AAA, authentication, authorization, and accounting. So who are you, what have you, uh, who are you, what can you do, and what have you done, right? So uh, I plug in, I, I, I come in with a username and a password and says, oh, yep, yeah, that's good. And now here are the resources you have access to, these servers, these printers, things like that. Active Directory uh, controls all that. Active Directory is part of, uh, uh, if, if you have a Microsoft Office or, or different types of office environments, it's to, to control your users and what resources they, they can access. So that's Active Directory and the Radius servers is the one that does that AAA function. Oh, I, I do mention at the bottom that simple network management protocol. Uh, we do support, there, there's security management packages out there and usually uh, what you need to, to be, a security managed packet is a database of devices out there and the, those devices have characteristics and our high net has certain qualities and characteristics, and we provide that in a bit of software that gets loaded into that database, and that's called a MIB file, Management Information Base. And so that we can supply to you, so you can plug this thing into your security management path. So the target market, perimeter security. Let's say you have a large uh, campus and you have a perimeter around your campus, and you have access control points into your campus, and on those access control points, you have your gate operators, and let's say in this large campus environment, you have a nice security management packages uh, to, to allow you to monitor and manage your, your different devices out there. And you have a high net on there, so it's feeding into that security management package. And that allows you to uh, notify your security pers personnel of any breaches and threats and your maintenance personnel, the faults, errors, things that are happening on that gate operator. By putting something on the network, it gives you the flexibility to, to not only communicate that, but access different things if there was an application involving like a SQL server as well. So we've, we've talked a bit about this remote diagnostics, remote access into the, your gate operator. Uh, uh, you can control your gate from a distance. We can actually use the software to open and close and stop that gate remotely. Now, whenever you do that, if you're doing something remotely, you wanna have some visibility on that. So the HiNet also supports an IP camera plugged into it. So you will have a camera watching that gate before you're trying to control it. The gateway system over you here for the high net, uh, the high net comes ready uh, to be plugged into the, the RS-45 ports on your, uh, the smart touch controller, your gate operator. It also support the smart DC controller, but in this presentation, we're just talking our hydraulic gate operators here. It comes complete with a cable harness that you have to make your own uh, cable uh, because we don't know where you're putting your your high net, so it could be set up to be stored in your, your gate operator itself. It could be in the guard shack. It could be in another building quite a ways away because uh, we can either connect it via uh, the ethernet cabling and ethernet cabling allows us 
100 meter drop lengths, or we can use that RS-45 and cable distances for RS-45 are two to 4,000 feet. So you can keep that uh, unit quite a distance away. If you are connecting multiple gate operators to the, to the high net, the first gate operator gets connected directly to the high net, but the second and third and up to four gate operators will get, get connected via cabling that plugs into the RS-45 ports. In the upper right corner, we have those RS-45 ports. There's two of them. And, and so we daisy chain from one gate operator to, to another. And here's one of the airports up here in the Northwest. They just recently replaced all their slide drivers. And on each one of their slide drivers, they decided to put a high net. So they have quite a perimeter and a number of openings that are quite a distance from them. But from the central side, they can pull, look at every one of their operators, update all the software, uh, view it through the IP camera. In, in the photo on the right, you can see here, here's the high net itself. You can see the fiber optic coming in that SFP port. Those are those two orange cables at the very top. These two other green cables are going, you can see these are little uh, PoE injectors over here to the right. PoE stands for power over ethernet. The reason they're using the power over ethernet injectors is because the ports on the high net are not PoE. PoE allows you to send data and power over an ethernet cable, right? So let's say you had an IP camera setting up on a pole someplace you're gonna to need to have a data cable and a power cable coming to that. And if, if, you, if you're using PoE, you, you can just send one cable, an ethernet cable that supplies both data and power. As I mentioned, these are not PoE ports. These are, that's why they're using the PoE injectors. You can plug uh, that IP camera into the PoE injector, gets a power and data, and then you plug your injector into the high net switch. The Canadian Pacific Railway a couple of years ago uh, had a, about 10 truck terminals and they were working with a company out of uh, Columbus, Ohio, and they were writing an application that would allow a truck to come up, use a touch screen, and to be able to, to log in, put in a bunch of data, the gate would open, the truck would go in and either load or unload, and then leave the premises. The HiNet allowed them to do that because they could integrate it all, tied in with their SQL servers, and it created a touchscreen application and it saved the truck drivers quite a bit of time. And here we have a couple slides showing con connectivity for, so this is ethernet con connectivity here. This is uh, enterprise LAN. I'm showing the, the high net connected to that RS-45 uh, smart touch controller. There's the high net gateway in the middle. We have an ethernet cable plugging the high net gateway switch into the customer's switch, right? So now we have the connectivity. If you have a PC hooked up to any part of this network, they can then bring up that high net uh, software, the embedded software, and to be able to control, open and close the gate and do other functionality on the high net, uh, on that gate operator using the high net. This one is just strictly on a local area network without internet access, right? And on this one here, we're showing to where we're going through a router and then we're getting out into the internet. And so now someone with a remote PC through the internet can access your gate operator. And I'm just going to show you a few of the, the, the embedded web server screens here so you can get an idea of what, what you're working with here on the high net embedded web server, the, the GUI here. And this is the first screen you get to. It does indicate here the high net software version, uh, how many operators are connected to this one. This says we have one. That can be one to four, right? Up to four operators can be connected to one high net. And there's the operator software for the high net as well. On this screen here, we're giving status in that window that, that's blank here. If we had an IP camera, you could have an IP camera feed coming through that. You can see the logs here of whatever's happening there on that gate operator. Here's the events page where you can look at all the logs on one to four gate operators. You'll pull them specifically from the gate operator. And here's the screen that you can use to open and close. There's the open and close buttons there. Stop, reset, right? And here's a window too where your IP camera, because I, I mentioned if you're going to operate this thing remotely, you want to have some visibility on that gate operator, right? And you can see here, here it gives you the status that's currently open. If you were uh, to, to click the, the close gate button, then you'd see that arm open up and things of that nature. And I think that's about it for the high net, John. Well done, Daniel. Thank you so much. That concludes our presentation. This is the third webinar in a series. And we just wanted to say thank you so much for your attention and your time. And if there's anything that we can do, if you have more questions, you can reach out to us through our website at highsecurity.com and we would be glad to help you. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Yeah, get a hold of us. We're happy to do a live demo showing how we control the gate too. So thank you. Thank you, everybody.